We are the California Faculty Association. We represent the 29,000 faculty who teach at the 23 campuses in the Cal State University system, which is the largest higher ed system in the country, right? That is a lot to handle. Yes. We graduate where near uh, almost 500,000 students a year, right? That is a lot to hold and handle. And in the midst of that, we're dealing with an academic culture. Yes. Uh, it is a culture of individualism. It's a culture um, of critique. Um, it is a culture of really having to help people to adjust themselves to this notion of us. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you all, you panelists and Adrian can, can speak to that, like methods, ways in which we overcome that, especially when we're trying to do something collectively and as big as social justice unionism, um, and bargaining uh, and a bargaining campaign um, where folks on the other side are in the alternate universe that share this. <laughs> I think part of the answer to your question is that we have to kind of relinquish this idea of enemy and othering and all of the ways that decolonial decolonization invites us to remember that we are actually connected and we are actually I think of us now as a super organism on a planet that is full of other organisms that we are in relationship to. And so this alternate universe you speak of, it's not a myth, right? It's like, it's truly, especially with the way the political landscape is right now, people are getting different information, different worldviews, different values, and you can move through life. You can kind of be like, I'm only gonna see this. And that, narrow worldview has actually been of service to those who are privileged in our society. So they're not eager to give it up. And the thing that I think keeps opening that door is they're not happy there either. They're not necessarily happy there either. And this was the trick I figured out with rich people. <laughs> so I was like, you've got all this money and you're miserable and you're lonely and you're isolated and you feel like a fraud and you're depressed. Mm. And I mean, like, what the hell? <laughs> Don't give me any of it. Um, you know, or maybe a little bit, you know, I need to get by. <laughs> but this idea of having enough is not present for those who are currently structured to privilege from these circumstances. And the gift I think that we can be in practice of is what is enough? What is enough? And consistent, consistently asking ourselves that. And now when I do visioning work myself or with others, that's the question I'm always asking is, are we satisfiable? What would actually satisfy us? And what is the timeline in which we can experience that satisfaction? And is that timeline mm -hmm. satisfiable, right? I'm like, if the answer is, oh, three lifetimes from now, you could be satisfied on this thing. I'm like, then this is not the vehicle for me because I want it now. My people have already been lasting and lasting and surviving and being unsatisfied and being not even given an opportunity to think about what would satisfy us for too long. So now as one of the freest black people to ever live in pure relationships with other free people, what is gonna satisfy us? What is enough? And there's nothing vengeful in it for me. You know, There's nothing in me that's like, I need to destroy someone else for my satisfaction. And I keep checking on that because there's days. <laughs> there's definitely days where I'm like, <laughs> do you have to die? <laughs> um, but mostly I come back into my center. I recognize that the hurt is in that person or the hurt is in that system. The hurt is in carrying, carrying too much for a person alone to carry. And the answer is in community. The answer is in the collective. The answer is in relationship. I think a lot of our uh, current work really is about changing systems uh, we are academics. We have, you know, colleagues that are just concerned about selfish things, uh, and many of them have thrived very well in the system as it is. Uh, so when we look at uh, the changes that we want to see, I think something that's always helped us in our current ARSJ work is really emphasizing the demographic shift of our students. 
Uh, our students really allow us to be very <laughs> strong and forceful about the direction that we're taking our union, uh, the issues that, and concerns that we know are important. And I think by looking at systems uh, that need to be changed, it means we're not really attacking individuals. We're saying that if the system changes, it changes and makes it better for all of us, uh, particularly for all of those folks that really have not had access to the center of power and the ability to make decisions on their campuses, et cetera, et cetera. So it really makes it just better for all of us. I think that's one way that we're dealing with uh, this academic world that we, we live in. Mm -hmm. I like that, Charles. It reminds me how much I've learned from my students. I think um, from teaching really challenging courses on racism, which when I started was in white classrooms and the demographic shift has really changed my course evaluations. I went from somebody who made no sense to somebody who is just so intelligent and so enlightened, <laughs> right? And of course, I didn't really change but um, in what I was teaching, but I did change in how I was teaching. And that's what I'm saying is that that practice, the pedagogical practice where I knew I had to establish a relationship with my students. They had to know that they were okay with me no matter whether they were A student or F student, not that I look at them that way, but they feel that, right? Um, and I was like, you are not your grades to me. You know, um, we, are, we are all here together in this journey together to work on this subject together. And I just found that when I could make that loving connection with them, we could go anywhere in subject matter than if I was, and, and, and I could get upset with them. I could be like, what is this bullshit, right? But they could hear it because they knew they were okay with me. And I just think that was such a good lesson for how we do our anti-racism social justice work in CFA is we have to be, you know, like you're okay with me and we are doing this work together. And then from there, we can do much. Right, mm -hmm. it's like the conflict itself is generative that that piece is always so you know to me that's the breakthrough of any relationship or any community or any group is that we don't try to tuck away the conflict that we don't try to smoothly glide over it but that we recognize like when you're agitated when you're really you know when you failed or you're upset or you're mad at me or we misunderstood that's when the skin is in the game you're like i care enough to care mm -hmm. i'm feeling something because if i don't you know a Virgo son, I'm like, I will not talk to you and I will disengage and I can be very cold actually. But if I care and I'm in it with you, you know, we're going to fight. And I feel like learning that changes everything. And I keep thinking about this, you know, I feel like it at every scale, the fractal component of it, where it's like, oh, it happens at every scale. So the people who are scared to fight in the academic realm, there's, they're not, having good conversations at home either. They're not having good conversations with their families. They're not having, you know, it's like, it's total. And so we live in that society that's like very violent, but has blinders on the actual conflict. And it's, it, I hear y'all changing that, right? They're like, we want to take off the blinders. We want to actually look at each other. And that means there's going to be tension and we're going to stay in with each other because that, that's what loving is really, you know, it's loving. I really appreciate what you're saying and, and Charles and sharing what you all were sharing as well, because I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in that, you know, the institution or the university, which is made up of people, right, um, do want, you know, I don't know how to say this, but I think oftentimes what happens is that it's so easy to center the institution. Mm -hmm. And in centering the institution, um, it allows us then, or others, to objectify, right? To mm -hmm. evade, to objectify, because the values and the goals of the institution is not centered on humanity, anti-racism, justice, and so on, 
right? And so when I think about our work and our accountability to one another, because as CFA, it's not this other third entity, it's us, right? So we have made a very conscious decision that it's not the institution that we're centering, but it's the community, the collective that we are centering. It's each other that we are centering. And that to me can sometimes like you were sharing, be a lot harder because you have to then engage in the conversations that are difficult. You have to embrace each other in those moments that can be difficult. But you also, we also uplift each other in those moments that are so inspiring that keeps us moving. But when we're in an institution, almost 24 seven, even through Zoom, it's a daily conscious decision to decenter that because it's so easy to slip into that centering of, of what we work and, and are in. So can I ask you a question inside of that? And all of y'all could answer this, but like one of the things you're saying is like, we're doing this anti-racism work, we're doing social justice work. And one of the things I always experienced in institutional spaces is that the use of the institution to depersonalize is the main way that we resist the changes that are required in order to turn and look at race honestly and in order to turn and look at injustice honestly. And so I would imagine that there have been a lot of challenges <laughs> and there are a lot of challenges that you're dealing with. And it sounds like one of the strategies is bringing the people back into it, but I'd love to hear a little bit more, like what are the challenges y'all are coming up against and, and how are you responding to those as you try to bring the human back in and center in that, that institutional space? Well, I'll, I'll just say this. Um... And I'm really responding to something that Margarita said. We're trying to have conversations. And one of the things that our ARSJ work is doing is uh, we're helping so many, and I, I'm gonna say it in terms of, of race because we have to talk about race. We cannot not talk about it. I, I think our ARSJ work is helping our white colleagues have conversations that they just haven't been having yet whether it's about students, whether it's about other faculty of color. And I think that's real important there. Um, but in terms of challenges, there are many. Sometimes they're very specific to an issue. Uh, but I think it's this disrupting, this unsettling of the academy that is something that we're, we're dealing with. Even folks who maybe can give lip service to the ideas that we're presenting to actually begin to do it and make change is, is slower coming. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Uh, Charles, I, I appreciated um, that witnessing. And I think Adrian, the lessons of that, uh, that you offer of emergent strategy, right? Around beginning with the small, um, you know, I think that one of the ways I see our union holding space for deep transformation is, um, is through the small, is through um, creating um, conversations where, you know, white folks, like white bodied folks like myself, you know, I, I say I'm sort of in recovery from white supremacy culture on the daily, right, and patriarchy on the daily. Um, and that's, that's a real gift um, that has been, um, built, I think, collectively and through, you know, mucking through um, challenges and um, building trust. And I also carry, I carry it with me um, in the small sense because whites, I know white supremacy culture um, and being trained as a sociologist in the West that looks at systems um, has led me as an organizer to be, let's get things done, let's be expedient while looking past people right in front of me, right? And so that, that gift of, of coming back to relation to, um, to really noticing um, how people are doing students. Um, you know, one thing we're struggling with is the faculty who are our counselor faculty 
are very overloaded and they do deeply intimate work with our students. So, you know, at my campus, like, there's one counselor for every, I think, 3,800 students, right? And, you know, many campuses, you know, are, are struggling with, you know, it's a labor issue, it's a mental health issue for the counselor faculty themselves. Um, and it's, it really, um, it really shows that all the university talk about student success and well being, um, you know, isn't being walked. So I just, you asked, you know, what are some of the issues? And that's, that's one, but I, I also did want to lift up the, um, just the ways in which you, um, you have talked about how can we be abolitionists with each other? So like, how can I abolish within me the will to dominate the, the you know, um, will to obey hierarchies of the institution, right? That Margarita mentioned, right? Or the, the forms of dehumanization that I may not even, I wasn't even trained to notice. I was explicitly trained not to see, right? And to be okay with. So I just wanted to raise that and, and lift up the, the work of the counselors as well. There's something also happening in the chat a little bit in regard to like our positions. I mean, it is yeah. hard when we're talking about hierarchy and we're in a yeah. what people are like, this is a hierarchical system. It's like people are kind of trying. I mean, it's hard to make change when people are like, this is just how academia is. Uh -huh. And I'm a lecturer. I actually have more job security now because of retirements in my department than I've ever had since COVID started. Mm -hmm. I've I've been in the community college system in California before COVID started. You know, I have taught on three different campus campuses. I would drive to reservation land to uh, teach on one remote campus in Northern, Northern California. You know, I was on so many i would be on three campuses simultaneously and barely making ends meet and working as a gig worker as a studio assistant i would write i would copy edit in my free time i did all this stuff i mean these are a lot of the things that people are carrying just to get by and that's what faculty really look like you know and it's really hard to get people to like recognize that like we all have to stand together if we're going to make any kind of change at all when people yeah. are like but also if i speak up i might not even have a job next semester and that means i'm not going to have health care and how do i even see myself as part of this whole when i'm just teaching one class i don't have an office i don't even interact with any other faculty so i think it's really tough that we're yeah i mean our identities are are definitely shaping the way that we participate with one another, but our positions within the institution, they do vary. And our, our, the precarity that we experience as lecturers is really intense and scary. And, you know, I was gonna take a pay cut until the week before the semester started. And I picked up another class, you know, and just the workloads that we have to carry to make it through is really tough. So trying to organize people when they are not seeing themselves all on the exact same in the exact same position where they may experience a little bit more privilege in their position than others and then lecturers who are just so desperate like honestly like desperate <laughs> and scared and trying to get people to organize when they believe that they can't you know uh, they're having a hard time really understanding like their connection to the whole <laughs> 